and there are many good stories about him. What is it here? Okay, that was okay. Yeah, among his eccentricities was, and uh, Pramod probably is well aware of it, he uh, collected and organized all his books, and he had a great collection of reports. And he would write to people in the room saying, please send, send me this in this paper and so on. So I sent him a few and so on. But one of the letters had gone to a co-author, former co-author of his, called Peter Fall. And uh, the letter came to Peter Fall, you know, please send your paper XYZ and so on. Peter was busy, he didn't pay attention and so on. A month or two later, comes another letter with a rubber stamp on it. Second request. <laughs> you know, please send the same letter for second request. So Peter Fall wasn't too happy. He went out and he ordered a special rubber stamp. And he stamped it and sent it back. And the rubber stamp said, request denied. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, what was the original request again? No, no, that please send me your paper oh, okay. in this, uh, such and such uh, journal and so on, okay. So that was one. Then, you know, we had many, I've known him since 1960 as I mentioned, and, we have had, and he was a colleague in Stanford from 64 to for seven years or something, seven or eight years. And uh, so we would know him and we'd meet him for dinners and so on. Once we were in Zurich, and he had invited my wife and me to, my late wife and me to dinner. So we went uh, to the door. He had a big home in Zurich. Some of you may have been there. And uh, he answered the door, and he was in a three-piece suit. Uh, you know, tie and vest and all that. And I was just like this. <laughs> so I thought maybe we were going out to dinner. So I said, I'm sorry, I don't have a tie. He said, it doesn't matter, Dina. Is by Dina. Uh, Dina will find one for you. Okay, so that's fine. So we went in and we were chatting. Dina, Sarah was with Dina in the kitchen. And, uh, no, she was chatting. Rudy and I were discussing different things and so on. After a while, Dina comes and says, Dinner is ready. <laughs> I was puzzled, but we went for dinner. So then I said, I apologize. I don't know. You know, I'm not dressed for dinner. So Dina said, Don't worry. For every meal, whether they were company or not, he changed and dressed for dinner. <laughs> day in, day out. Day in and day out, wow. he dressed for dinner. <laughs> Just his wife and he. <laughs> anyway, okay. Well, there are more. Some are really shocking, and one of them I've never told anyone, and I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> but it blows my mind, actually. So he has been. Now, about his academic career rather than his research career. You know, uh, he, from Columbia, he worked at RIAS, RIAS, Research Institute for Advanced Study, in Baltimore. I had not heard of it except uh, Rudy. And uh, so it was a big coup for Stanford when the dean told us, oh, I persuaded uh, Kalman to join the faculty. So we thought he would go join electrical engineering, but no, you know, one of his eccentricities or weaknesses was he never wanted to be regarded as an electrical engineer. He always thought of himself as a mathematician. But the math department would not uh, give him a position. So he took a position in operations research, okay. which is fine, but all his students came from electrical engineering. <laughs> So he had four or five students at Stanford. One of them was Tony Tether, who became director of DARPA later and so on. So, uh, okay. But, you know, he had some peculiarities. He would lecture on system theory, which, and, you know, he had a few students. Ed Kamen was another one of them and so on, Marshall Banker. But once he said to me, you know, one should not be too clear in lecturing because then your students will begin to compete with you. 
<laughs> Did you have such an experience? <laughs> yeah. So he, you know, and so he was not very popular. And then, you know, in uh, he came in '64. I was still an associate professor. In '68, I became a professor. And then he was not. He felt he was not being given the respect that he was due at Stanford. So one day he invited me to lunch at the faculty club, and you know, I said, you know, when it came the time to pay, sign the bill, I said, I'll sign it. No, no, I'll do it. I mean, we had to pay, I think, remember these days, two dollars, I think, for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we had lunch, and he was trying to tell me that I should go to the uh, provost of the university and so on and say, Carl is such a great man that we should offer him something like university professorship. So Stanford never had that. And I said, you know, this is above my pay grade. So, <laughs> so it's because you have to, the way out he says, okay, about that dinner, please give me the two dollars. <laughs> <laughs> because the lunch didn't work out the way that he expected. <laughs> I mean, these are all weaknesses. So then finally, he, you know, he got an offer from uh, Florida position and he, he told the dean and the dean told me later uh, to say that I'm leaving you know he thought now the dean would make a counter offer so the dean shook his hand and wished him well <laughs> so okay right similarly in Zurich by the way he was not the most popular professor but he was so and he was brought there by someone called Henrici and uh, who was numerical analysis and I knew Henrici especially through my friend Gene Gollum. And he, so I had spoken at uh, ATR. Uh, not, uh, Rudy would come and listen to my talks and so on. And Richie said to me, you know, he's so unpopular here that I'm sorry that we invited him. And after five years, technically, you can terminate his appointment. But he's too famous to terminate his appointment, so we just let it run. <laughs> I think I had only one student in Zurich, Thanos uh, Antulas. Antulas, yes. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. Okay, so, you know, his academic career was uh, mixed. Now, at Florida, I, I, uh, the stories I know is that there was another famous professor there, Popov. There's also something called Kalman Yakubovich Popov Lemma. Okay, right. So, somehow they had a falling, maybe Rudy invited him to Florida. No? They had a falling out. And so Rudy forbade Papa for his students to attend his seminars. <laughs> right? <laughs> Childish, but that is Rudy. <coughs> so, you know, anyway. But he had a... He kept both positions. No, at, at 65 you have to retire in Zurich. Compulsory. Mm -hmm. And you have to lose your office. So he, you know, he was grumbling about that to me also. So that's his academic career. Now, uh, let me tell you how I first met him. I, th I think I mentioned to the people who were here at Lotfi Seminar that Lotfi arranged for me in October 1960 uh, to be a speaker at a conference in, uh, at the Rand Corporation in Santa Monica. And what I said, there were only 17 speakers and uh, 250 attendees. Uh, Bellman had grouped this into four areas, aircraft, rockets, and guidance, communication prediction and decision program, and decision, programming, combinatorics, and design, and models, automation, and control. So, of the 17 speakers, they were distributed in these areas. Angelo Mieli, I don't know, some of you in the control field may know the name. He was a name that I recognize there. There was Emmanuel Parson, David Middleton, uh, two people famous in programming, Tucker and Wolf, LaSalle, who was a co collaborator of his address, and Bellman himself. And the, among the speak session chairs were George Danzig, Grant, anyway, Lottery Zade, and you know, Charlie De so many people attended and so on. So uh, Rudy's, uh, my talk was on what I call adaptive match filters, which has something to do with signal detection in which it's like the separation theorem in control. You first estimate an, 
communicating, communicating through a random channel, randomly varying channel. You estimate the channel and use that estimate to do your signal detection and so on. But the estimates that I had were smoothed estimates using present and future data. Rudy talked about uh, calculus of variations and optimal control, but he gave me his paper, a famous paper on the Kalman filter. Now, there's some debate, and I couldn't check it recently. 59 or 60 was it? 60 in Mexico. Mexico. I think Mexico. 59. That's the optimal control. Uh -huh. Sorry. Uh, uh, I guess his should... first paper was uh, his first papers were on optimal control. Was it done in Mexico City? That was uh, yeah, yeah earlier in 1960. Yeah, this was maybe 59. So he gave it to me. But to me, you know, it was it talked about state space, which I had never heard about. And, but I browsed through it and said that the, he could not solve the smoothing problem that would be left to a future publication. And so I ignored it because I, I needed smooth estimates. But then, uh, with my first student actually, uh, we wrote a paper on feedback communications, which was uh, uh, very well received, let's say. But it needed recursive estimates. And then I remembered Kalman's uh, paper, and uh, so I began to study uh, state space and so on. And you know, the best way to learn a subject is to teach it. So I even began to offer courses in uh, system theory and so on. And many years later, it led to my textbook, which is the only thing many people know me about, <laughs> but which is very different from what I did for first many years of my career. <laughs> It took five PhD theses <laughs> and lots of things. So that was uh, the linear systems book. No, but then I got interested in Kalman filtering, and uh, you know, we made innovations. Was we took a do? It was very interesting that Kalman for the continuous time Kalman filter, the approach that we used uh, for the discrete time filter could not be continued carried over to continuous time. So, though he was incorrectly so, actually, saying that we never need, is there something I should do? Uh, we know half and all is old style, that you shouldn't use that anymore and so on. But Busey and he, when they uh, solved the continuous time problem, uh, had to use the Wiener half equation and manipulate that and so on. Anyway. So it's sometimes called the Kalman Busey filter. Or if you read Busey's book, it's called the Busey Kalman filter. <laughs> <laughs> Even Homer and Arts, so all great people have that. <laughs> but many, but you know, uh, though he did not use the term and the concept, there was a famous paper explaining Wiener's work by Bodie and Shannon called a circuit's approach to the Wiener filtering theory. And that introduced the concept of innovations. That if you have a process with an arbitrary spectrum, to solve the equations is quite complicated. You need the so-called Wiener half technique. And there's a story that, okay, too many stories, so I won't tell you. But uh, they explained it by first saying, take the process, convert it to white noise by means of a causal filter. Once you work with white noise, the integral equations become trivial because the correlation function is a delta function and any integral with a delta function is trivial. So that was the innovations approach. And in continuous time, I found the analog of that. And so uh, we wrote a series of seven papers on the innovations approach, including for nonlinear filtering uh, and so on. But Rudy was saying, you know, he told me, and he truly believed that the Kalman filter was not his most important contribution. I mean, and to be honest, I agree with him. Because what made the Kalman filter uh, famous, and what is used as the Kalman filter, is really the extended Kalman filter, EKF. Because most of the problems was Okay, he came to give a talk at uh, NASA Moffett Field, and Stan Schmidt was in the audience. And NASA was just, you know, launching the space age at that time. And they had these problems of navigation and guidance. And these are nonlinear equations. And 
now how do you do it? And Peter Swale, they were using recursively, I mean, it had been proposed recursively, squares and things like that, for linearized models at different operating points. So, uh, Stan Schmidt and his group made two contributions. They applied the Kalman filter to these linearized versions, which is different because now the Riccati equation is not independent of the observations, it depends on the observations. So you have to tune it properly. And secondly, they broke up the Kalman filter into two steps. One is called time update, and then measurement of the time of, because when you observe satellites, you're not observing continuously. One ground station picks up the thing, and then, and you make some measurement, get an estimate. By the time you go to the next station, it's a time passes. You have no measurements. So you have time update process through the state transition matrix. Then comes the next station. There were three around the world, actually, at the time. Uh, Canberra, say. And now you get measurements and you make measurement update. So you need to break up the carbon filter into two steps and Smith and his group did that. So honestly it should be called the uh, carbon schmidt filter. And then, quite unknown to many of these people, in 1959 or 60, a Russian mathematician engineer called Stratonovich had made a drastic change in the study of uh, such problems by going away from Gaussian processes to Markov processes. He was one of the pioneers in that. And of course, with state space, you're really talking about Markov processes. So he's, he solved the nonlinear problem. And as a special case, he solved the Gaussian case. And his equations are exactly the Kalman filter equations in a different notation. And, uh, you know, I wrote a book many years later, 1980, where all these details are given. And, but, you know, by then Carlin was already famous, so Stratonovich was forgotten. And in fact, there's nonlinear filtering, so you have to use a new kind of calculus called Eto calculus, which Stratonovich did not know about and use. So his work was not reviewed favorably by the mathematicians. And when it was published, there was a footnote saying, this is not rigorous work, but it's interesting, so we'll publish it. Okay. And then someone wrote a very unkind review. He said, uh, then uh, Stratonovich found a new kind of integral, which is known as Stratonovich integral, as opposed to the Eto integral. Mathematicians didn't like it because of certain reasons, which are legitimate, actually. But there was a rude review by Skorakar, which said, the size of Stratonovich's book could be cut at 50% if he used the Eto integral rather than his integral. <laughs> anyway, so that was the, the Kalman filter. So what was Kalman's own view of his contributions and my own view? See, he, he, you, he introduced state space methods to linear systems. And this clarified a lot of things. I mean, Gilliman and so on, we're always struggling with the notion of hidden uh, cancellations. You know, you have transfer functions, and sometimes because they are polynomial numerator and polynomial denominator, you do not know that there's a common factor between them. So when you reduce it, though your transfer function now doesn't show the common factor, the system that you build has these hidden modes in it. So people were confused about this. Carmen came along and introduced, uh, you know, made a state space model, controllability, observability, and his decomposition theorem, that there's a unique way of decomposing it into four components and so on. And that made a difference. Okay. And uh, same with the Kalman filter. He, his mission was, and he says that one reason that he, at least I was told, one reason he left MIT after his master's was he was trying to tell them that you should use state space, space methods for circuit theory. And nobody believed him, so he went to Columbia. And people there were aware of it because a man called Vashkow had already begun what he called the A matrix and so on. So uh, there's a story that uh, Rudy told, uh, Lat uh, told Latvi Zadi, who was a professor at that time, that, you know, this is a new way of uh, describing, you know, instead of the high order differential equations, 
you should write first order. So that isn't what's new, it's an ints. There was a famous book by IMC, Ints Differential Equations. There's a chapter in it on taking higher order differential equations, making them first order and so on. But Kalman, you know, first introduced it to stability theory. He knew Russian, so he could learn the Lyapunov papers and Bertram and he wrote two very important papers on stability theory. And then he began to apply this technique to all the problems that he could think of. And one of them was the filtering problem. So he attacked it. Where was his, where did Wiener fail in that? Because for single input, single output systems, the Wiener filter is a rational filter so if you work with rational spectral densities, which is the only practical case, at least by electrical engineers. Uh, you get a transfer function, and if you wish, you can build it in a recursive way. I mean, you don't need, you don't need to build a full impulse response. If you put it on an analog computer, you really have to do it by stage space methods. But for the matrix case, this became very difficult, because now instead of a single spectral density function which you have to factor, you have a matrix of spectral density functions. And many people, including Wiener himself, struggled to find efficient ways of doing spectral factorization <coughs> in a matrix. Now comes Kalman, and he makes a huge change in the problem. Because if you take, say, a 10 by 10, or even take 4 by 4 spectral density matrix, what are there, 16 uh, rational functions in it, count the number of coefficients, they are huge. Okay. But this may have a five-dimensional state space model. So the number of parameters in the state space model is much less, basically 25 plus some linear terms and so on. So, and then you can solve it by the Riccati equation. So Kalman's method solved the uh, matrix problem, which was outstanding at that time. Moreover, once you're in state space, then it's only a question of notation. You know, instead of writing a matrix A, or F as Kalman used to write, you put a bracket and you put F of T. And the equations are all the same. It's just that you need more storage and so on. So you could do time varying, which is an important contribution. <coughs> People had tried to extend Wiener's work to time variant, and in the classical way you couldn't do it, because you couldn't factor these uh, covariance functions and so on. So uh, that is a help. But there is one thing, and uh, Pramod may talk about this. Calvin was very proud that even if you have an unstable system, which you're trying to predict, the Kalman filter is stable. So that seems like a result that the Wiener's theory could not ever have. But I discovered much later that that's true. But if you have a model error, and instead of f, you have f plus delta f, you lose this property. The Kalman filter doesn't work anymore. It sort of works if you close the loop, estimation and control, but the pure one. Anyway, I just say to say that I think Kalman was right when he felt that his main contribution was not the Kalman filter, but first his work in linear system theory, and then he made it very algebraic. I mean, he was remarkable in that sense. He introduced the modular, he, he, in automata theory, there's this thing called the road equivalence. And when you specialize neuron equivalence to linear system, it says that instead of putting an impulse and measuring the response, which is how we traditionally characterize a linear system, you should put in an impulse and stop it at the origin, say, if you have a bed, and then measure the response from then on. So you, the map should be not from past to future, but from past up to zero, future from zero. That's the Hunkel matrix. That map is the Hunkel matrix. And then you do the realization theory, which O did and so on. So Kalman liked that, and he worked with, uh, I mean, he got familiar with people at Columbia, Eidenberg, and others on automata theory. And he produced, he went in that direction with modules and so on. And he, he worked on prime numbers. And he, now, one of his, uh, and I'll end with this story. He wanted a Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knew it. <laughs> Everybody knew it. They wanted a Nobel Prize. They're not going to get it in engineering. 
That's supposedly the story that Nobel's wife ran away with. No, <laughs> mathematics doesn't have a Nobel Prize because uh, Alfred Nobel ran away with his uh, mistress of uh, mistress of no. I'm a mathematician. Ran away with the mistress of Alfred Nobel. So that's uh, that's apparently not true. But uh, <laughs> so uh, he said, which is the field where I get economics? Now, economics has linear models. So he, you know, worked in economics, and I think he made some contributions. I never quite followed it. But one day, a famous economist is Sanford, Kenneth Arrow, my view, who got, I think, the first, almost the first Nobel Prize in uh, economics. He wasn't the first, Samuelson, I think, maybe. But uh, he calls me, he says, Rudy wants to come and talk about his work in uh, economics to the economics department, so I he wants funding. And uh, can you support it? So on. I forget, maybe I gave some or I didn't give, whatever. But it didn't go too well. <laughs> so, anyway, so the economist, to my knowledge, never quite followed up. Though there was interesting work on errors and variables and so on. But, uh, anyway, but you know, he was, he was remarkable. I mean, he had a beautiful paper on the root distribution problem of poles and zeros of a polynomial rational function using some very clever, sophisticated algebraic methods. I never quite figured it out, but I was amazed by how beautiful it was. So he was really a great man with great insights, but like all great men, he had some weaknesses too. Thank you. Well, I uh, have to say that I enjoyed my interaction with uh, Rudy Coleman, but uh, he and I are about as far apart technically as you can find uh, two people. Uh, I'm a sort of a geometer of machines, and he was a mathematician. But I want to give you a little background on why he came to Florida. Uh, <clears throat> it turns out that the only competition for engineering as a school in the Southeast in the 65-70 time frame was Georgia Tech. And the University of Florida wanted to be at least equal to Georgia Tech, you see? So they hired a dean by the name of Tom Martin. And Tom Martin hired, the year I was hired, 25 faculty overnight. Just boom. And um, he had an immediate and long-term agreement with the state legislature that they would build up the University of Texas, uh, the University of Florida Engineering School. And uh, that was primarily because of the NASA program that was going into uh, Florida. And uh, about three years later, the legislature was forced to build a whole bunch of engineering schools and schools of technology, whatever, in South Florida. At which time Tom Martin said, see you, <laughs> I'm gone. <laughs> and uh, so to make up for this uh, sort of visual uh, dilemma, the following dean hired Rudy Common. That's my understanding. So Common had an image that he brought with him to strengthen the University of Florida Engineering College. Um, so that that kind of began that history of the University of Florida and Rudy Common. When I was there, I was able to visit his library. Robot, you did many times, I'm yes. sure. I lived there. Yeah. <laughs> you lived there, right? Um, he had a personal library on the campus, you might say. Uh, he had a large collection of books, and he had some assistance to keep the books in condition, as a matter of fact. Um, the library was a very large user of space. And as University of Florida, we had almost no space for anything. It was an amazing condition. It was a good school. But when it came to space at that time, there was very little space, so he had this large space and that was a symbol that some faculty didn't care for, as you can imagine. Now, for various reasons, Rudy thought I was sort of a friend, I guess. I'm not sure why. Nonetheless, he asked me one summer, he was going off for four weeks, and he was building a house in Florida. And he said, would you oversight this construction? 
<laughs> okay, so I go along and I said, yes, I think I can help. So I go there after about a few days and they're putting up the siding. I'll just put this aside, I'm sure you can hear me. Anyway, half the nails were not hitting the tuba forms. <laughs> I knew that Woody would not like this. Because <laughs> you can imagine how troublesome that would be in the future. So we stopped to work on the house, and he got home, and he had all the sides taken off, uh, and the siding was replaced with careful nailing, you might say. Now it turns out my daughter, Lita, was uh, going to the university at that time, and she babysat the children for the Clones for many times. And she found the children to be very respectful and very pleasant. Now, um, he then, after I came to the University of Texas, he was sort of in between uh, Switzerland and Florida, um, I enabled him to get an invitation from the IC Squared Institute. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's a major think tank at the University of Texas. It's run and established by Kosmeski, who's one of the three owners of uh, Teledyne. And, uh, Kosmeski had a lot of uh, stature, uh, very highly regarded. I had a lot of discussion with Kozmeski uh, at six in the morning and sometimes five in the morning and things like that. Anyway, so uh, Coleman wanted to come and give a talk. So I invited him through Kozmeski. Uh, and um, so he wanted this on economics. <laughs> you already got the message, right? <laughs> Kozmeski was a business school guy and he knew a lot about Kozmeski. Uh, <laughs> economics. So he considered that Kuzmeski would help him get the Nobel Prize. You see, if he came and gave a talk. Something like that. Do you, do you mind? I hope it's not no, too no, rude. No, no, no. <laughs> so he traveled with his Alfa Romeo from yes. Florida. Very proud of his Alfa Romeo. I know. <laughs> uh, he crosses the uh, Highway 10 bridge in Louisiana. You probably know it's about 10 miles long or something. In a bad storm. And he runs into the rails and hurts his alpha. He's more unhappy about the alpha than anything. So he doesn't even show up for the talk. And so we didn't even know why he wasn't there. <laughs> so we had uh, no follow-up on this canceled visit. I just mentioned this kind of to illustrate the unusual individual that Rudy was. And uh, a lot of people understood that. Uh, but they were real pleased to have him at the University of Florida. Now he was also in Switzerland at the Federal Institute. He had a beautifully centralized, nice facility there. He'd been there, I'm sure. Large personal office, off reception, some library facilities. And then he said, and I think you mentioned it, he had to defend this facility from time to time. You know, it wasn't so easy to keep it. Uh, now it was in his home in Zurich, as you mentioned. And uh, it, he told me, it's strange sometimes when you get this kind of uh, anecdote. It's only four blocks from the house that Einstein had. Yeah. Who, he said, without any reservation, won the Nobel Prize. And he wished to have the award very badly himself. Well, he told you this. More or less. Yeah. I wouldn't say it in so many words. No. Right? <laughs> but I, I'm more recalling. But did he tell you his home would not be urban by Rudy's home? Was owned originally, well, I didn't know that, no. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Did you have a tie on when you went for dinner? <laughs> I don't remember anymore. <laughs> I had quite a bit of time to discuss it with him. As already mentioned, he sometimes had hard wish words for his competitors. Right? Um, he sometimes, uh, even at the University of Florida, he sometimes had lecture content on others' lectures and so on. I think that's been pretty well demonstrated. One question I'd like to raise uh, for my close colleagues who are very knowledgeable, and we have audience people who are extraordinary people here, and I don't want to be too presumptuous, but it raises a question I just can't resist. Uh, Mo is on the verge of having 150 graduates in his graduate program. I have generated 235 of these young people. As an academic, I consider that my first priority. So I'm raising the question, how is it that he was so successful but had so few students? 
And is this something? Answer from <laughs> somebody will help me with that because I can't quite follow it, considering what academic bureaucracies always tell us we're supposed to do. Okay. I just thought I'd raise that question because I think it's a very interesting fundamental policy question for institutions. We're supposed to serve young people. And I've made my effort to do that. And I sort of want to know why that didn't occur in this case. Is that a decent question? It's a decent question. All right. Thank you so much. Here, I wish I could show my slides because then we'll, we'll see. Uh, we are running out of time, unfortunately. Um, uh, he was born in uh, on May 19, 1930, and passed away on July 2, 2016. Uh, I uh, was an undergraduate student in at IIT Bombay, uh, where Mo you can actually lecture. Uh, and it was in my final year, uh, I was doing some graduate level courses in control. And I would go to the library uh, and, and read. Uh, and I would read books and papers. And so I ran into a proceedings of a conference. Uh, and there was a paper written by Kalman uh, in, that, in that proceedings. And I read it. And I was just absolutely blown away by the clarity of his writing and the thinking and, and so forth. As, as many of you know who has read his papers, he was just a, 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 fact, just a fantastic uh, author. And so I thought I was going to do, go for a PhD, so I thought wouldn't it be nice to study under the master himself. And uh, in, a, in, in just a sort of bold move, I decided to write him a letter. Uh, and I wrote a letter to him, handwritten, uh, I was worried about my handwriting, so I wrote it in all caps. And I, I, I airmailed it to him, saying that I've, you know, I've been reading your papers, and I'm so, so and so, and I've done my undergraduate in electrical engineering. And wouldn't it be nice? Uh, if I would be just absolutely uh, uh, delighted if I could study under you, but I cannot do so because I don't have the money, and so I would need some financial assistance to be able to do it. Now, I never thought this would go anywhere because you know, I figured he would get hundreds of those letters. I mean, he's not going to pay attention to a letter from me. Within a few weeks, I actually got a response back from him saying that uh, he was very happy to accept me as a student and I would get a letter of financial support from the university uh, shortly. And lo and behold, that totally changed my life. So in 1978 fall, I came to Gainesville, Florida. Uh, as his PhD student, and I, I uh, studied under him. Uh, he was uh, somewhat unusual in terms of uh, an advisor, uh, atypical, uh, in that you didn't really work very closely with him. So it wasn't like he was working on a problem and then he would say, why don't we work together? That wasn't the type of relationship he had with his students. And so uh, there was a postdoc by the name of Errol Emre, and there was a group of, of graduate students that we, we uh, studied together. There would be visitors like uh, Professor Kailath who would come and give seminars, and these, uh, as was mentioned, the, the Q&A got to be quite, uh, quite aggressive. And it was really an enormous intellectual exchange between the visiting professor and, and Kalman, and we all kind of absorbed by osmosis uh, this intellectual uh, environment that we were thrown, uh, thrown in. So, uh, it, it partly explains what, what uh, Professor Tezar was asking is, is why did he not have the kind of, you know, PhD students that many others, uh, very successful people have had, is because I think his style of working with the students was just totally different. Uh, I never wrote a paper with him. Uh, most of the students I know that were contemporaries did not write a paper with him. Uh, he uh, certainly took graduate education uh, uh, as part of his mission, so, and he thought uh, the best way to fulfill that was through the seminar. So he would come, uh, even though he had a position in, in Zurich, he would come to Florida and give these long sequences of seminars. So one thing I remember when I was an undergraduate, when I was a beginning graduate student, he was working on partial realization problem through continued fractions. 
So it, would, it was like a work in progress. So you could see, you would stand up there and give these seminars two hours long and write by hand with chalk. And uh, we would all be sitting there and sort of listening to him as he, as he sort of, you know, explored this problem in, in front of our eyes. By 1980, I finished in 81 uh, with him. Uh, by 1980, his uh, interest had shifted to economics. Uh, so that was for the last, I saw him sort of move from system theory, uh, algebraic system theory, uh, to economics around 1980. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, Tom mentioned Popov. I have the distinct honor of having both Kalman and Popov on my thesis committee. <laughs> it was uh, because my, my thesis had to do with the uh, linear quadratic problem, uh, invariance of the linear quadratic problem that involved KYP lemma very centrally. So I, I asked Professor Kalman, you know, would it be? Uh, yeah, oh, that's correct. Thank you. You managed to do it. Um, even if it wasn't, we would have that slide in the video. Yeah, and yeah so this is, you know, this is a picture that I think pretty much he, he's a little bit older in this picture, but that's what he looked like. Uh, certainly, my memory of him is very much this either three piece suit or this very, uh, you know, carefully dressed man. Uh, uh, we have written uh, two obituaries, uh, which I would recommend. Uh, the readers to, to, to read one in Automatica, one in Control Systems Magazine, and I myself written two papers, uh, not very long, just you know, two and four pages, uh, one in Control Systems Magazine that Don also has written in, and another paper that I just published in Annual Reviews in Control. So again, you can look at it. Uh, this is the, the paper we uh, wrote uh, in, uh, this was the obituary we wrote in uh, Control Systems Magazine, uh, and then you know, we have these highlights about what his work uh, was and, and what it did, and Tom certainly covered a lot of it in, in his talk, and then it goes through the narrative of, of his work. Uh, and then we have this tribute to Professor Kalman with a number of essays, including by Tom and Kuchera and uh, Sanjay Mitter and, and just a whole bunch of people uh, who wrote in his honor. I mentioned some of these uh, already, uh, and I, I was at the point of saying that it was, uh, and my thesis committee included uh, included Papa. Uh, but when I went to study under him, he was very much into algebraic systems theory. And so, when I got admission, there was still a few months before I could, I showed up in Gainesville. So I wrote him a letter saying. You know, I'm so excited to come and study under you, and I have a few months, maybe I can prepare myself to be ready to go when I show up in, in Gainesville. So, do you recommend anything that I should study before I show up? Now, remember, I'm a standard electrical engineering undergraduate who got a bit of applied math through a crazy type of book. So, not very, you know, heavy math, math background. He wrote to me saying, Oh, before you come, you should study Zaristian Samuels, Community Algebra, two volumes. <laughs> I dutifully went to the local bookshop. Luckily, they had cheap Indian editions of Zaristian Samuel. I bought them. I opened the first page and I realized I was in big trouble because I knew nothing about uh, commutative algebra, let alone linear algebra, let alone sort of you know, basic algebra. So I, I had to learn a lot very, very quickly. And you know, Tom mentioned module theory and all of that. I had to pick that all up in my first year as a graduate student. But it was a it was a fantastic ride. He was a, he was obviously a very gifted man. He was extremely intelligent, uh, dynamic personality, uh, unique way of thinking. Uh, I think he had a tremendous taste in problems. Uh, he, he worked on really really good problems. Uh, he didn't work on everything. He would be very selective in what he chose to work on. What I want to do in the remaining few minutes is share with you some uh, quotes that I have picked out from his uh, many writings, uh, which I think were groundbreaking and offer a, a glimpse in, into the man's mind. So one of the first things that I wanted to kind of point out is, uh, is the definition of system. And so, you know, he talks about how systems is a very fuzzy uh, thing, but for him, System theory is a branch of mathematics. So when you think about that, set, that sentence, that he, he sees his own thing in his place as a branch of mathematics. Now coming from an engineering background, 
you know, control systems was a, you know, was, was a field of engineering, but he wanted to position it as a branch of mathematics. And I think that color and, and drove, and, and I think Tom kind of mentioned some of this, in, where he wanted the field to be, to be respected as, as, as a branch of mathematics. And uh, he worked tirelessly to, to make that happen. This is another one, and again it shows that he, he didn't think of, uh, he, he thought it was very much mathematics. So to put it more bluntly, control theory does not deal with the real world, but only with the mathematical models of certain aspects of the real world. Therefore, tools as well as a control theory are mathematical. Then, you know, he, because he, he had this enormous body of work that was focused on algebra. So you wonder where did that come from? And there is this really interesting uh, passage uh, in uh, topics in mathematical system theory, where he says, uh, although convergence conditions are essential to lend mathematical respect to transform methods, in the engine literature they are treated very loose loosely. You know, like how limits are taken without any sort of formal mathematical uh, justification. And then he offers his own reason why this all works out is because it's really algebra and not analysis that's at the root of all this. And I think that kind of drove his thinking. And, and the narrowed equivalence that, that Tom brought up, I think all drove uh, his, his uh, move towards algebra. Uh, he had an enormous interest in uh, sort of diverse fields of science. So, so his library that, that Delbert mentioned, which I lived for more than three years, uh, spending most of my days in that library. It was an amazing collection of books and papers. Uh, and then he would invite these people, like one of the visitors was Steve Grossberg from Boston University who worked on neuroscience. And, and there would be talks about the brain and so forth. And this quote uh, is sort of to exemplify what he thought would be connected between neuroscience and control theory and the circuit diagrams that would explain the brain. And whereas he wrote this in a somewhat qualitative way, some of this is being realized. So for example, the latest theory of the brain talk about how brain is a prediction machine. And it's constantly predicting the future state of the world. And when the future state does not agree with uh, the, the actual reality, does not agree with the, future, with the prediction, then the brain uh, adjusts itself. So that's very much like the innovation thing that Tom mentioned, as well as what, what Kalman was thinking uh, when he was writing uh, this thing about neuroscience. He has this very interesting passage, uh, which I think is a little bit uh, on the, on the extreme part, uh, it, it shows how, how rigorous his thinking was. So he, here he's talking about adaptive control, and um, he says, you know, that when we, when we are doing control, there is enormous amount of knowledge embedded in the models that is coming from our, our work in sciences, in physics, chemistry, mechanical engineering, and so forth. A machine which could provide adaptive control for arbitrary plans could also replace human beings in scientific experimentation and model building. So he's saying that if we could truly do adaptive control, we would need all this. And therefore he says that okay, this is not something that he's going to pursue because of, of what it entails. As it turns out, if you look at the latest stuff that's going on in artificial intelligence and robotics, it's very much aligned exactly with the point that's being made in this, in this particular paragraph. Uh, he had great respect for physics, uh, and so indeed in my so, so this is from his acceptance decision at the Kyoto Prize. Indeed, in my opinion, the development of technology since Newton is an even greater human achievement than development of physics. Although he was admirer of physics and, and science, although it's important to remember that modern technologies depend upon prior knowledge in physics, and one of his great achievements consists the problem of technology of control which is also one of the most important system problems. So he was very proud of how far the field had come and the contribution that it had made in, in the scheme of science and engineering. Whereas he thought of himself as a mathematician, and, and certainly you know, that's what drove his own work, uh, he, he had enormous interest in technology. And, and this passage, uh, uh, such technological achievements as man flight, the transistor, computers, ICs, lasers, and many that might as well be far more important to humanity as a whole than advances in basic sciences, and they are largely systems problems. 
The individuals who have contributed to these, they were not easily identifiable, but that should not diminish our thanks to the contributions involved. And so I think he's sort of expressing the achievements of technology and how they come about and, and their role in terms of, uh, of modern science and engineering. Uh, this is a paragraph that kind of speaks to his view of, of social, I mean, economics and social sciences, and he was very, very critical. Uh, and he worked a lot on noisy realization problem uh, from data uh, in the setting of econometrics. Uh, and, and here is a, a paragraph where he, he felt that this was a hard problem that was unsolved. A prejudice-free methodology for dealing with noise data does not yet exist. Conventional ideas from statistics cannot lead us to it. Yet it is surely not impossible to find a way. It may take another new turn to accomplish the leap from the exact noise free realization theory. That's the one that he was very proud of having uh, contributed uh, through state space and uh, Henkel matrices and, and uh, the road equivalence type of ideas to so noisy realization theory. I am more modest in my hopes that someday someone will stand here to receive your very generous prize for it. This is the Kyoto prize that he is receiving. And this is my final slide, which I still, for the life of me, don't quite understand what he's saying, what he means to say, I, I invite you, the listener, to draw your own conclusions. Uh, so I just read, obviously there are things far beyond high technology, far above what we know about science today, things that are beyond anything our generation can analyze, think about, imagine, feel. I take as my last words the beginning of a medieval hymn, which Mahler used to begin his eighth symphony. O come, creator of the human soul. Uh, I don't want to speculate uh, beyond what is written by him. This is, this is his own writing. But this is my uh, sort of last uh, observation uh, of Kalman. So to conclude, uh, I certainly am extremely grateful uh, that I was lucky enough to be a student. Uh, I certainly had uh, a long association with him from 1978. Uh, I benefited handsomely from, from that association. He was a, a big influence on in my professional life and personal life. And with that, I thank you and uh,